Uh, is it on? Okay. On now, are we? All right. So, now that I've got new glasses, because I lost the other ones, So are we on now, Sarah, are we? You can actually see me. Can people see me now? Hmm? They can see me. Oh! Oh! Every now and again, things can go sort of half wrong. They can go sort of moderately half wrong. They can go sort of big half wrong. They can go just wrong. Or they can go straight down the toilet. Well, the other day, I was pushing the lawnmower around. And uh, I had my glasses somewhere. I had them in my shirt like that, right, sort of hanging in there. And somewhere... I was pushing and shoving the lawnmower and in the grass and all that sort of stuff, all wonderful and rural and, and countryside and, um, and, and basically earth type of person I am. Um, somewhere in the struggle to, uh, to, to rein in the excess of the, of the recent rainfall, which has given rise to a very, very robust growth of grass, uh, somewhere in that journey, in that challenge of, of, of preserving the perimeter of civilization, I lost my glasses. So, um, uh, so I have, I went over the the set area and spent considerable time. I had Furby and Noonup. I said, Furby and Noonup, I want you to look for my glasses. I drew a picture of a set of glasses for them on a bit of paper. I said, this is what they look for. Where are they now? They're not there. There's, they are. There's Furby. Um, and I said, see if you can find these glasses for me. And they, they sort of looked up as they were munching on their bone. And, um, and they went back to it munching on their bone. So the glasses were never sort of found. And somewhere out there in the wildness that surrounds me here, with the tigers and elephants and monkeys, there will be a set of, of, um, of nice um, goldy sort of coloured glasses and I'm quite sure that um, monkey bouncing around in the trees out there one day soon with a pair of monkey, with a pair of glasses on him. So that's the glasses story. Now to back that up, I'll give you one more. And those of you, some of you will appreciate this. Some of you will say, "Well, Robert, you should." Um, why did you ever get those teeth in the first place? Um, well, that's another story. Well, I'll tell you the story anyhow. Here it goes like this. Well, after pushing the law, so I then decided to go and visit a, a new French bakery down the road. And he's a lovely chap, this guy in there. He said, he, he, there's a restaurant beside there called Arroy. And they do great mussels on a Friday today. They do them, actually. It's as many as you can eat. Um, they're from um, Phuket, on the other side of the, um, on the Indian Ocean side of the peninsula that stretches down to Indonesia. And they, they come up here, and he is, you can eat as many as you want for, I think it's 280 baht, which is about $7.50 US. So you imagine that, all right? So you've got all this... You've got these, these lovely mussels that, is, that are steamed with lemongrass and, um, uh, and they're just, just absolutely fantastic. They really are. Anyhow, so I went, went to see and after the grass incident, um, I sort of detached from reality because I couldn't see much of reality because I didn't have my glasses. And, and then so I ventured into the Arroyo and there, there I met this French baker. I can't recall his name, let's call it Francois. 
So I went, he said, come in. He said, and the, the owner of the restaurant, can't remember his name either. There's a memory problem I've got. That's because of glasses. Uh, he said, these baguettes here, Bob, are the best baguettes in, in the whole city. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, they're, they're beautiful, beautiful. Anyhow, so I had one. Um, this was this is this is not this is not last week. This is a, this is about ten days ago I had, and so I went back to the same shop after the incident. I went to the shop to buy a baguette, and um, hello, there goes my telephone. Why don't I turn that telephone off? It'll be someone trying to sell. I won't buy. No, it's Phil the jockey. Just hang on. Hey, Phil, I'm just doing a few things. Can I call you back? Oh, you're out to the temple out here, are you? Yeah, okay. Well, um, I'll tell you what you do. You go, you go, keep on going past the temple and take the first turn right. It's about another, about another mile away from where you are. Take the first turn right and then take, go along about two miles and then you'll take another right. So the only two rights you can take, right? And then you take the next right. So you've got three rights to take. Now make sure you take the first right, first right, first right. Three first rights. Okay, and then some dome houses and that's me. All right? Okay. What's that? Where left? They're all right. Yeah, okay. They're all right. Every... No, no, he goes up to the big temple. So he goes along past the temple and he turns right at the, at the motorbike shop. Then he goes along past Ivan's and he turns right over the bridge. Then he comes around here, then he turns right again. There's three rights. The right hand is this hand, folks. The left hand is that hand. So I go back to the shop. And this is after the, the glasses in the grass incident. right? And then I go into the shop and I buy a nice baguette. Now, these are crunchy baguettes. These are, the, these are the best ones here. They really are because he's got the right flour. And you can't make a good French baguette if you don't have the right French flour. You, can't, you can make an Australian baguette with good Australian flour. I believe you could make a good French baguette with good Australian flour. Um, but anyhow, he has just the best baguettes. So I'm, I'm waiting for this, and so I put it in my mouth. I'm, I'm sitting in the car, and I'm munching away at this French, fresh French baguette. And then I feel something go wrong. I thought, what's What's that? Have I, got a, I must have something. There must have been a, a lump of wood in the baguette or something. It must have been a, a fishing sinker. Something in there didn't, was, was sort of... I thought, that's unusual. And I, I think, and I'm fishing around. And all of a sudden, I pull out my bottom denture, which is broken. It's been two pieces. So I said, good grief. So I'm sort of flummoxed by this. I'm sort of driving along, and I've got these. I've got a bag baguette sitting there that's half eaten, and I've got a bottom plate of my dentures sort of broken in half by this very crunchy, very very strong uh, French baguette. So that's what I do. So then I start. What can I do now? There's two things going wrong in one day. This always happens in threes, you remember, and I'm thinking. Well, should I, bet, should I even drive the car now? Maybe, maybe I'll get hit by a flying bus or a low-flying 747 plane or something like that. You never know. You see, these, these, are the, these are the perils, the perils of living in the modern world where we've got false teeth, plastic teeth, and we've got eyeglasses. and all that. 14,000 years ago, we didn't have any of this problem. Well, even more recent than, say, 400 years ago, we didn't have this problem. Did we, Furby? Furby's coming over to give me to console me. Come up here. That's a good girl. Oh, you're a good little girl. Oh, you're a good little girl. You say hello to everyone. There's Furby. Furby's got a tick there. I can feel a tick. You got a tick, have you? Oh, you got a good girl. Oh, you're a good girl, aren't you? A good girl. Yes, you are. You're such a good girl. 
All right, you can look, my, look for my glasses, okay? So there you go. So the last stream I cancelled because A, I could, didn't have my new glasses. Where are they now? They're, where they're gone. I put them down somewhere again. Now I've lost them. Where have I put them? Oh, there they are. Now they're, they're in amongst the oil paint. So I've, got, I've had them, a new set of glasses made up by a lovely man in Bangkok who's one of the great um, eye doctors um, uh, in, in Thailand, actually. Trained in Philadelphia. Uh, went to university there and so forth. And we have some great times together, actually. And Roy's mother, um, um, uh, Kun Lek, was professor of paediatrics at one of the universities, the best university in Thailand, and she's, I've been teaching her how to paint. So there you are. So I'm going to be, now that I've got my teeth all fixed up, I went down, and there's another story, how to repair your own teeth. Um, I could go into that, that'll be another, another 10 minutes. So, look, my whole life is one life of just adventure after adventure after adventure after adventure. Now, the next adventure is, of course, the workshops. Now, so, if you look on the Facebook page now, or wall, you'll see that I posted, yes, we've got live streaming going today. And so, but beneath that, I go into um, a little bit of a refresh piece of news, which is good for all of us. And that is that um, um, through, the, through the whiz bangery of, um, of the internet, um, the logistics making booking uh, maze of trying to climb through um, eight or nine workshops in a given period of time was starting to flummox me a little bit. But anyhow, through the internet and the whiz bangery of, of, um, of communication, blind, blind speed communication, uh, we're able to solve all that pretty quickly and that put that put a breath of fresh air into the um, the workshops because we didn't have we don't have to cl close off on June 1 so that's the good news so the, the better news is that we've been able to extend those those cutoff points through to 30 days before each of the workshops and that gives a bit more time for people to to, to organize themselves and to spread the word and to generally get all buzzed up. So, um, Watertown, for example, now we've made some changes. The Watertown, Wisconsin has been amalgamated from the Beaver Dam um, workshop as well. So, both those are coming together now. So, if you're in Wisconsin and you want to um, get a, a, a real lift up, a real, a, real, a real bang for your buck in how to paint, well, well, join me at the one of the workshops, all right? The one at, at Watertown. So, and the cutoff there is June 20. So we've got 21 days, 20 days to go there now. So um, Rita Mayamak there is looking after the, the organising and Rita um, is doing a wonderful job and Rita always does a wonderful job. Never, never ever say Rita doesn't do a wonderful job because she does. And uh, our thanks are to Rita for organising that. And anyone there who wants to power on and really lift their painting and get things steamrolling along and, and put a bit of uh, real energy and direction. And um, I suppose what I will give you is serious direction, is I'll pick you up from, if you're in the doldrums, if you're sort of got your mud, got your feet in the mud and you don't quite know which way to step to get out of the mud, I'll get you out of the mud, all right? And I'll clean your feet as well. So there you go. I'll get your painting properly. Right? If it's technical, I can, I, can, I can work. It's not hard. Now, I regard painting as one step removed from basket weaving. There you are. Because it's not, it's not hard. Just about everything in painting is relatively easy. If it's, if it's hard, it's because we just haven't applied um, the amount of energy that's required to, to solve that. Or you haven't got someone there to just open the door and show you the light on how, how big the room is or how small the room is. I'm there for that. If you're lacking inspiration, I'm there for that. I'll get you inspired. It's easy. It really is easy. All the time I don't know what to paint. What do you mean you don't know what to paint? You don't know what to paint. I mean, you must be, you must be in, a, in a black world, in a, in, a, in a room full of darkness. Because out there, you've had experiences. You've had wonderful moments in your life. 
And they are all sources of inspiration and motivation. Right? So they're the things that drive us forward. So we've got Watertown, then we've got Florence in Colorado, July the 4th. Now we've got a few people there. We need more people in, in Colorado. I mean, Colorado, what a great state. And what a lovely town Florence is. So, I mean, just go for a holiday. Take your husband along. He can go golf. You can learn how to paint. Enjoy the scenery. You know, honestly, it's all there. Orofino in Idaho. Orofino is just about fully booked up. I think it is. Um, it might be one spot there left. That's July the 11th after the 4th of July. So you've got one week after that to sort of get, get yourself organised and, and, and check in. Naples in Florida. Naples is just about to the brim now as well. August the 21st. So if you're thinking about, um, if you're in Florida, um, you're thinking about a workshop and you want to get yourself going again and in a different way, then, um, you know, come and see me. Come and see me. McDonoughoo in Georgia. Now we've got, we got one there on the 26th and the August the 29th. We're, we're, we're full on one workshop and we're starting to fill up the second workshop in McDonoughoo. So um, if you're in Georgia, we had one in Johns River, but we didn't get the numbers there. And then how, um, was it Ruth Hall came forward and she said, listen, we've got a bunch of people here, Bob, who want to do a workshop. I said, well, whoa, whoa, let's go for that then. Let's go for that. So not only did she, we got one full, but we got another one sort of, backing up as well just before that so um, I'm gonna be busy for about what, six or seven days there no baguettes although I do, wouldn't mind a few down there Asheville in North Carolina Asheville is um, that's a beautiful spot of the world there I've spoken to a few other people who who have been through there and they said Bob that is really just a stunning part of the world and he said that the, the, the people like well I Talk about people to, to me in America. I, I've never had a bad experience in my entire time I've spent over there. I've spent about eight or nine years there, just about full time. Um, and I just find wonderful people. There we go. And you are. Williamstown, New Jersey. Now, that's the last one. And, and, and Rita is going to make sure I really perform at that one. So if you're anywhere in, in, in New Jersey or in the, in the adjoining states, and you want to get into that workshop, then, then sign up. You've got sep till September the 10th. So you've got a good spread of time to get to that one. Um, we've got that one in October the 10th. We start that one. So that's the three-day one. Again, they're all three days. So there you go. So anyhow, that's the list. Hang on. This will be... Just hang on. Yeah, Phil. Yeah, have you? Yeah, I don't know what that is. Um, listen, what I'll do, what I'll do, uh, where about say, why don't you go back to the temple? Yeah, now, if, it, if you go to the 7-Eleven there, Phil, go to the 7-Eleven and just wait in front of the 7-Eleven there, right? Uh, yeah, it's on the corner, just in front of the big temple. Okay? Okay, and, and then, um, uh, are you on a motorbike, are you? Okay, then. Okay. I'm doing a bit of live streaming now, but I'll send Sarah down, and she might be able to go down and bring you back very quickly. Okay? All right. Okay, okay. Hey, Sarah, can you go down and get Phil? And then I'll just, just set the camera, and I'll talk to the camera here and tell them what we're going to do. So just bear with me for a moment, folks. I've got a friend who, who, um, uh, who wants to come out here and see my dames. We've got, uh, I'll take you for a little, I'll do a video clip later of the, the dome and you'll see what I'm doing. Anyhow, enough about that. Now, what are we doing here then, Robert? Well, I'll bring you in here. And we'll just set it in close there, Sarah, like that. Oh, it's okay. Are you right? Okay, there you are. Now, you can see what I'm doing here. I'm doing, this is a big painting. This is a commission. And uh, you can see I've got some pretty powerful 
horses going pounding through the water here. And I'm just putting the, the, the brown markings on them now. I've picked out these ones here. And, um, um, and uh, I've, I've got one over here, which is in another. I've got all these photos. Where are they? They're all down here anyhow. And they're all... Sometimes... Um, anyhow, what I was going to do here... I will, I'll do a little bit of work on one of these horses here. I'll clean up my brush. And I'll have a look at who's with us. And uh, answer any questions while my assistant goes off to get my friend, who's a... The only reason is that, like, Phil is a, is a jockey from Australia. And, um, he, I mean, jockeys are an interesting group of people in society. Um, not only are they small, but they're also generally... Um, you know, it's a, I mean, you look at how they ride a horse. To be quite honest, riding a horse the way weekenders ride a horse is more of a pleasure. But when you're riding a horse, a race horse, it's doing, say, 30 miles an hour. And you're perched on the back, and the only thing holding you on there are the stirrups, right? Your both hands are locked on the side of the neck of the horse. Your butt is not engaged in, in the seat at all because you're elevated. You're, you're sort of, you've got your, your back is horizontal to the back of the horse. It's parallel to the back of the horse. And your head's forward, so you're in a pretty uncomfortable position. If the horse is to... to, to um, uh, if it wants to, it's easy to dislodge you. So jockeys are, you know, doing 30 miles an hour with a bit, couple of bits of leather to your hands uh, with other horses sort of pounding beside you. Um, it's, a, it's a dangerous sport. Um, I've, had, I've had occasion in my life, I had, I've had a number of horses, uh, thoroughbreds, and I had one, the best in Australia at one stage, actually, um, won everything. It, um, there's no greater thrill than seeing a, your horse go past the winning post time and time again. And you never get tired of seeing it go past the winning post time and time again, neither. That's the thing. So Phil's coming out here, and Phil was a professional jockey in Australia for many years. And uh, he made his mark. He won many big races. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he's retired from that now. But they never really... Jockeys never really retire from from a sport that's occupied them day and night. And I do mean day and night because they, they get up early in the morning. Um, they, they've, they've got a rigorous program. They've got to keep their weight down. They've got to... Um, um, they've, they, they've got to live a very, very controlled and, and very organised and, and um, uh, um, compressed life because their, their weight and their fitness is paramount. Uh, I mean, the, if, you cannot be an unfit jockey and expect to win a race. The horse won't do it. The horse will go as fast as it can, but a jockey can virtually lift it over the over the finishing line if he has to. So it's a real, it's a, it's a, um, it's a very skilled occupation. So I'd better do a bit of skilled occupation, uh, occupationing here, I suppose. So I was over here doing this tree the other day. I'll bring you over here and I'll just do a how I do. Where are we up to here? What are just Look, you see, what we've got here, this horse here needs darkening. We've got some nice work in here. We still haven't got the little markings in there. Let me find some markings on that horse. I can't find the horse. Right there. The horses are never far away. Now we're... No, can't find that one, so we'll go this one. Uh, let's go to this one over here. Let's go this one over here. Now, I'll push you over here. And we're going to go to that one. Let me just see what you're seeing there. Yeah, you're good. You're good. You're seeing that horse. Right. Let me have a look at this one. Okay. Here we go here. Now, let's look at how 
Now, the horse is not popping out yet. We're, I'm in the process of integrating. I've got, I've got mountains here, semi-finished. I've got trees here, semi-finished. I've got foreground here, semi-finished. I'm now trying to work in the horses. So they're pushing beyond the semi-finished stage. So, but I'm in a, in, a, in a no man's land here at the moment. I've got two horses here which need work. So I'll push this one over here along a little bit. Now, I'm going to go for some yellow and put them in, I'm going to mix up some yellow ochre and, and some, and then a, a grey. And of course the grey, my grey comes from light red and a blue. Well, I've got a blue here. I've got a blue, that's a phthalo blue. So it's pretty deadly. I don't have any cobalt blue. But I'll tell you what, when I get to the workshop, I will have cobalt blue. But sometimes things just don't happen the way you want them to happen. Um, now let me see how I'm going to do this. I want a bit more... I've got a grey there. There's a nice grey. And you see how I'm working this, this brush? I'm skidding it. Now I'm virtually on to straight paint. I'm going to mix up a grey from the cobalt blue, from the phthalo blue and light red. And that is straight paint. And I'm looking for the... And I'm going to get the magnifier in a moment. I just want to get a bit of paint on here first. Now let me try and find where the darks are. Right, clean the brush. Over comes our magnifier. Now the workshops, um, I'm going to be, when I come there, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to, one of the, we've got to know why we're painting. We must know why we're, why are you painting today? What do you want to achieve by painting? Is it for this? Is it for that? Is it for this? Is it for that? Once you can answer that, then we can go to the next step. And that is, if, if for example, you're going to paint for competition, or if you're going to paint to sell a painting, right? They're both different, diff, they both require a different strategy. If you're going to paint one for your house, it requires a different strategy again, because you're going to be thinking about the colours in the room, about the, about the furnishings, about the size, about where the light's coming in, about the balance within the room, right? The colour of the walls, you're going to be thinking of all those things. So there are, there are different governing forces that will tell us what to do next. If you're going to paint for competition, one of the things you'll do, you'll say, well, where's the competition? What sort of competition is it? Who is the judge of that competition? Maybe you should have a look at what he paints, where his particular paint chance is, where his direction, where his, his head is in terms of art. Is he a, is he a fine artist? Is he a still life artist? Is he a figurative artist? Is he a waterscape artist? Right? They're the things that tell us what, how to answer that question and what we're going to do with our, with our painting. So one of the things we're going to do in the workshop is go through this process of finding, of establishing a direction at the very get-go. Once we've got that direction, then we can start to fill out, flesh out the answers to that direction. Um, if, if, you, if you want to paint an impact painting, you want something that's, that's very strong, that's, that's going to get attention from anyone who walks in the, in the room, what, what, are the what are the elements that give you that attention, that strength in a painting? Is it mood? Is it colour? Is it shapes? Is it the narrative? Is it the size? What is it that's going to give you that impact? Okay, so once we, once we answer that, we go through what these elements are. Right, so a workshop to me is more, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a walk down the road of knowledge, of answering fundamental questions first, because without that, you're just going to be where you still have been before you met me. And I want, you, I want to have an, an impact on you. I want, to, I want to make you, I want to equip you mentally with a... With a, with a, with a a, with a, a pathway of analysis and a pathway of sol and, a, and a bank of solutions, but you can't you can't find an answer before you find the question, right? 
And this is where a lot of people end up in the doldrums in painting. They don't know where to go next. It's because they don't have um, a, a thinking um, template to, to start each, from which to start each painting or to which to even go think about painting. We need to go answer that. So I'm going to turn up with a series of answers to the most common questions about painting. If it's, if it's a competition painting, right? I'll have one that will answer that. If it's a painting for a room, I'll have a painting that I've done for that. If it's a painting about um, um, for, 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 um, to sell, I'll have an answer for that. In other words, I'll come up, I'll have with me a number of paintings which answer these very questions. So I'm not going to just talk about them. I'm going to give you an answer to them immediately in front of you. And then if you want to go that way yourself, then I can walk you how I handle that. I can take you to that conclusion, the same conclusion I went, I found, and how I found that, I'll give you. So you, you, I will lead you along the road and tell you where not to go and where to go and the reasons for those decisions. So that you come away with, with, a, with, a, um, uh, with, with a bank of information and knowledge that will enable you to, to free float after that. Um, if, if you find a problem, you go back to that basic, those basic rules that, we, that I lay out for you and those thought processes. That's important. So, this is a commission painting. So I've got to get it dead right. Now I've got to think, what did, the, what did the people want when they ordered this? Well, they wanted horses, so they're getting horses. Let me get some of this going here. We want to get this main, this, lay some. I'm just going to move that brush so that we're getting, laying in a, a colour which is going to find its way. It's also, up, also a colour up in there. So we don't, we're not using colours that are foreign. So if I'm using this colour down here, it's going to talk nicely to what I've got up there. There's a bit of yellow down in there, and there's a bit of yellow all through this horse. But now I've got to make sure that whatever colour I use, I'll go back to my grey now, with the yellow in it, lighten it up. So whatever colour I use, it's got to find a natural partner in the other parts. I'm using the magnifier as I do this. And off I go, down here now. We're into the, into the neck of the horse. And there's a, that's, that is straight paint on there, folks. That's just the linseed, it's the medium in the paint that I'm using. And I'm just scrumbling it on like that. There's enough linseed oil in that to for it to spread on the horse. Now I'm going to come into a little bit of, that's all nice and um, warm there. And of course what we do when we've got warm paint, we've got to bounce it off with some cool. And here we go, down we go. So I'm laying in some, some cool there now. So we've got it warm against cool, and we can't go wrong when we do that. And down we go. Down we go. Ah, there's Phil. Hello, Phil. I'll be with you later. I'm just doing a little bit of talking to all our, all our lovely people out there. And uh, we're doing some painting. We're painting horses. As you can see, Phil knows all about... Oh, you'll find, you'll not, you'll find it next time. Well, I'm hidden away, Phil. Which is a good idea, actually. Well, just take a seat, and um, and you know this this might fire fire up into painting. Phil, you never know. You might be, you might want to paint pictures after this. So down we go, the horse's head. And I'm just going to clip the paint on here. I'm looking through the magnifier. And.
the horse's mane. Now that's the most important part. This is, that's the part that really people love to see that the mane just freewheeling out there and curls and comes back on itself and down here and as we go and coming to the horse's nose and it's about there and then the nostril is coming in there the bridge of our horse our horse I'll get Phil, I'll ask Phil some questions. If you've never had the occasion to talk to a professional jockey who spent, how many years, Phil, were you? I'll bring Phil over. Come over here for a moment. I'll practice this back and just, just come over and talk to us, Phil. So, you're all right. This is Phil. This is Phil, folks, and Phil's a... Professional jockey for how many years were you? About 25. 25 years. And you rode, how many horses you reckon rode in that time? What? Thousands and thousands. What? Rode close to a thousand. Close to a thousand. How, how fit have you got to be? I, I mean, you look at, I was, talking, I was talking earlier when, you know, before you came here, and I was telling the folks that one of the things, being a jockey is a strenuous oh, yes. moment because you, you, you're actually uh, young. You don't realise how fit you've got to be until you don't for a while. And right. Then you try and do it again. Right. But I had 12 months with a bad back. Yeah. It took me forever to get back to it. Really? Mm. So, it, 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 what, what, what would be the, the biggest challenge in staying in staying line jockey? Is it the... No, and and fitness. Do you, is, you know? Do you work fitness out in the gym or? Is the greatest factor. Yeah. The top jockeys are always the fittest. And how? Do, what do they got? A fitness program? They train or? Oh yeah, yeah. All that personal trainers. Most jockeys. Yeah. Have personal trainers. I never have one, but today most jockeys have got personal trainers. How dangerous is it, Phil? Have you fallen? You've fallen Many off. Times. Many times. Did you get hurt? Oh yes, I've. Uh, uh, fractured me back in two places, fractured me sternum bone, had a stable fracture of C1 on my neck. Yeah. My elbows, my skin there, dislocated both abs. Really? It's not the fall that hurts, it's the sudden stop at the end. Is that what it is? So, when, are you. Are, when a jockey has a fall, is it because of the horse? Oh, or because of other horses, or can be numerous reasons. You know, like you clip the heels, or they cross the legs and down they go, and it happens that quick. You know, you don't know. but it's the ones coming over the top of you that hurt. You know? They're all racing tight together. Yeah, it's the ones that come over the top. So if you're in the front, or you're in the lead. You say one or two, three horse in the front, and you go them down. Well, you've yeah. got five or six horses behind you, to, and the horses step. They they'll try and avoid you, but. Yeah. They go that fast and they fast and yeah. they can't. Yeah. Is it is it um, is it a career that you'd you'd advise other people to follow? Oh, it's something you've got to love. You yeah, can't right. do it unless you absolutely love it. Yeah. Because it's dangerous and it's strenuous and it's hard work. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to love it. Yeah. You've got to love it. And and uh, how many jockeys would would have another I mean if they if, if let's say that you start Jockey, when you say 14, 15, I mean, as a strapper, and then you stay within that, and by the time you say 29, 30, you just can't control your weight. So, what happens to that jockey then? So many jockeys have taken their own lives because they, they get out of the game at an early age and they are just totally lost. They they, just lost no backup, don't, yeah. There's not the backup there that should be. They put a lot of things in place in the last few years, but before that, it was just in place for them. No. At an early age, they just felt lost. They didn't know what to do with the yeah. That's all they knew. Yeah. How, when you, when you started with horses, how old were you? 
I was only 10 when I started. Yeah. I never had my first. Right. But you so you didn't really occasionally sort of to go down the street. And the year was never that heavy. Right up from me late for Yeah, yeah. I mean, with the food now, if you, if you eat a hamburger, you, eat a hamburger, you put on, I eat a hamburger, I'll put on about a kilo, it'll be two kilos. But, but with, with jockeys, if, if their metabolism is not 100% and they just overdo on the fast food, they'll just blow out. You Dog can't fish. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Everybody's got a drink. All life. When you're 40, sure, I was about 43, I 43. So you, you, I know I would have continued, but it was only through injury. Yeah. yeah, and you rode some big winners, Phil. Oh, yeah, I won the first million dollar race in Australia. 19, yeah, I fake won the first, first million dollar race in Australia in 1987 yeah. on the Gold Coast. Yeah, Gold Coast Magic Millions. You got a ring? Yeah, I haven't got it on. He's got a ring for that, folks. I've seen the ring. And the, no, Phil rode the first million dollar race in Australia. There you go, in 1987. So, and that must have been a bit of a buzz. Yeah, it was a magic million. Yeah. Yeah. So, I won an Auckland Cup, I won a New Zealand Cup. Skylines. Queen's The top flight hockey. If I'm You're throwing something at me. You can stop you clip around. I'm going, Phil. Thanks, Phil. You're watching for us. There you are. This is surprising. Didn't expect that, but I thought you'd be interested in that. I just have a look at this horse that I'm doing over here now. Now, you can see the. I'm picking away at that at the colour in here. How, look how this gradates. I'm going to take. Then I'm going to bring you straight up to that horse. Now I, want to, I want to show you something here. The value and the purpose of shifting colour. Now see the yellow in the mane there and around his cheek here. How beautiful it is offsetting that grey. But within the grey you've got little bits of warmth coming through. And that's what makes painting work if you're going to if you're going to do it, any painting at all folks involves that fundamental temperature switch all the time so it doesn't matter whether you're painting for your house whether you're painting for competition whether you're painting for your friend whatever a good painting has certain elements that are consistently applied to all of those paintings you look over here this is a good example of it too. Now you can see here the horse's head. And they look in there at the, at the change in, in um, colour. A little bit of blue up in there, into some yellow, some warm grey, a little bit of green there, but back over some blue over there. So a little bit of yellow here. So all these, that, blue, that yellow to that blue, now that's really, really important in a painting. Right? Because that'll make when you come back from that, you'll wonder why you look at it. And the reason you look at it is because of that that is doing something to your eyeball and to your brain. It's making it feel good. It's making it want to look at it. It's, it's drawing you into it because of the colour, the use of colour and the use of temperature. Not just it's a warm to cool. But it's also a, a, a fast, a fast walk into a warm colour and a fast walk into a cool colour. But in between those two, we've got this lovely mix of a warm and cool grey. Look over there, down the horse's neck. Same thing. Look at this horse. At the, the chest of the horse there, you can see how I've got some warm strokes, some cool strokes. Look at the cool up in here. And look at the warm against that cool. Right. That's really important. 
Now up here in the head, I've got no, I've got all curl in there, so I've got to put a bit of warmth in there to make this pop, to make it want to jump, to make you want to look at it. So I've got to come back to this one. So whenever you've got uh, in here, that's now this is a big painting. That is about three three inches by about one inch. So that's a relatively dead area, but if you come in close enough, you can see I've got red in there and blue. It's working, but not quite enough yet. I need to just put a little bit more red in there. Down here, look at this green popping in. Green boys against that red. All right, they, they, they just, they marry together. Well, look at this. This is a preamble to the splash of water. So we've got water in shadow here, which gives us this blue. Now, I'm using phthalo blue here, not cobalt blue. And you'll notice with the phthalo blue with the ochre, we've got this nice sort of turquoisey colour. So look at this fleck of yellow against that blue. It's magic. We come back. I'll just hold you there for a moment, and you can look at the water, how I've, how I've worked that water. Come in close. And that's very thick. That's at least an eighth of an inch thick there, bouncing off. And what did I do that with? I did that with the, um, the pastry brush and the fan brush. So, again, down in here, I'm starting to work this, this splashing water. And notice what I've done here. I've got blue over here, which is the shadow area, right? We can understand that. That's how it should be. But then as we come across where the water lifts, I'm going to put in some yellow in the lifting water. I'm going to put reeds in here. So that's against that blue. Look at that yellow against the blue. So you can see this is going to be powerful down the bottom. This is just going to be like a... Like a like a, the best meal you've ever had down here, because you've got two colours of the same value, opposite on the colour wheel, just powering against each other and making it all work. Dropping from from a from a, 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 a sort of turquoise blue into a deeper blue up here, and then down here you've got the same thing happening from a yellow into a red. So I'm powering the reds and yellows like crazy in there. So once I develop that on a big scale, this will be magic. But it doesn't all happen at one time. You've got to do it step by step. And uh, that's what we do. We've got to do it step by step. Anything that's worthwhile is done step by step. Even when I broke my, ten my dentures the other day, I lost them, Phil, and I went around with about a day, without, I thought I was going to lose weight very quickly, right? And I I, I, well, I didn't lose any weight at all. Um, I managed to eat um, a meat pie without my bottom teeth. So there's a skill in itself. So back to this. Now, um, if you have questions, have a look at if anyone's talking to me. I'll just put in this, just come back to this horse here. And I'm gonna, one of the things we need to do now is sharpen the shape. So I'm going to look for the horse's nostril. And wherever the dark is, I'm going to bang that dark in now. So let me find some nice dark here and put it in so we can see exactly what we have. Horse's eye, that looks pretty good. Horse's eye in here, the nostril, and over there, and down here. His, his head comes across there, and you've got to line up there like that, up to where his eye is, and there's a big shadow coming down here like that, and around his head, and down here we've got the mane coming forward down there, but we've got a chest and head shadow. Where the, the hair is sort of matted because he's running through the water. And under there, we've got a little line showing the 
where the main part from the... I'm going to put a few little f***s in here. And down we go. I'm going to just skid this brush now to show this hair that's sort of waterlogged. And down to there and come down there like that. And we've got a So on, and we'll put a bit of light in here and bring it to life in a moment. Now, these skid, this skidding technique really works because it makes it random. You don't have to actually sit there and paint all these little pieces. You skid your brush around. It's a form of scumbling, but it's better than scumbling. Scumbling is a little bit still too deliberate. Just see this in the, in the shadows of the water there, and up it comes, and there, and there, and we're really getting there, folks. And down we go. And he's, he's lifting there. I'll put some light on this, and we'll pull it out again. Let me see, we've got some light, and have we got many people, Sarah, that want to talk? They want to talk about teeth, I suppose. Horses. Nose. Horses back here, comes across like that and down. We've got a tail, it's going to, I'm going to put a tail flashing out there like that. I've got to try and finish this painting today. Uh, busy little bumblebee. And down here we've got the horses coming into his other leg. And then we get, we're going into uh, more of a, a drift into some colour here now. And a bit more yellow. I'm going to skid the brush in here now. And I'm going to back up with a little bit of more grey in there now to pop it. Pop that, that's a new word. There you go, folks. Learn something new every day around here. Oh, Learn it. Don't worry. Here we have some nice pop grey. We're coming in. We're echoing the water down below there now with that colour. This up here is echoing that. This one here is echoing the colour of the water. Now, why don't I put a bit of, just do a little bit of smart pants work here, Bob. Why don't you do a little bit of water for the folks? Okay, here we go. Let's do some um, some shadow water, water. So I'm going to mix a bit of the blue. I'm going to grey it down. Come with me. Don't, don't, don't go, don't leave, don't leave. This is important now. He's going to do something. Watch what he's doing. I'm Barbara Lunsford in, in Texas. You make pay attention here, Barbara. How he's doing this. How does he do it? That's how he does it. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, this is setting it up, folks. I'm not, I'm not actually doing it yet. I'm just come across to this one. Water's splashing, right? This one's in shadow there. This one, we're going to do a bit of blue on that one. 
Okay, so let's do some light. About one, let's run some reflections down here. Whoop, whoop. Let's do some light in there now. Okay. Paint. There we go. A little bit of white paint. And I'm going to add a little yellow. Okay. Build, creep your way to it. Don't try it and go to the end too quick. If you're going to catch a monkey, you've got to be smart. Right? Because monkeys are very smart. You know how to catch a monkey? You know how to catch a monkey? Catching a monkey is a little bit like doing the, the, um, the splatting here. The trick to catch a monkey, right? Because monkeys are driven by nuts and food. Their, their instinct for food is powerful. Um, the same as us, because we're, what, we're only about 2% genetically away from them. Um, I think there's few of us are closer than that. Um, I haven't met a monkey yet paint quite well as well, so I think the art lot, a lot, a little bit, we're sort of safe. Okay. But how do you catch a monkey? Well, because they're so driven by food, if you put some food in a bottle, and you make sure the neck of the bottle is only so big. And you tie that bottle with a, with a piece of string or twine to a tree. Right? So the bottle's tied to a tree. And you put some food, some nuts or something, in the, in the bottle. And then you go and hide behind a rock. Okay. And you get your paintbrush out and you start doing it. You start doing watercolour or something. Right into the monkey. The monkey come along. They can smell the food because they've got a good sense of smell. And so they look around, they look, they, they look at this bottle, and they can see the food because they've got dry side as well. And they can see the food, and they can smell the food. How yeah, they get the food? Do they pick the bottle up and shake it and so the food falls out? No, 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 no. They're not as smart as that. They don't know how to put cool against warm like we do here. So the monkey does, he puts his hand in the bottle. And then when he grabs the nut, he can't quite get the, the fist out of the bottle because the neck of the bottle is too small. So he's stuck there pulling this bottle, right? So what do you do? Oh, you 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 put your watercolour down, you're behind the monkey. You can hear the monkey <coughs> trying to get from the other monkeys. And they're all running around, but they can't, this one can't work out how he can't get the food. Because he's got his fist around the food. And his fist is too big to come out of the hole. What do you do? You go down there and you hit him on the head with a rock. You've just caught yourself a monkey. When he comes up, he finds himself at your place, on your, sitting on your shoulder. There you go. You caught yourself a monkey. So, these are, the, these are the, the very important things that I've learned over the years. And they all talk to paint somehow or other. So let's do Let's get this. Let's sneak up on this horse. So I'm going to use, here we go. So the light's coming from that side. So we're going to have light coming in here against that part there. But I'm going to have it here too. This is where I really want to work it. Here we go. Here we go. And the people who wanted this paint said they want crisp light. So Bob is going to do a painting with crisp light. Here we go. There's the light coming now down here. There we go. We need one big bang of light powering up there. And I think he's got it. And this horse over here. He's going to have some, some splash up around that horse's head. Because that's going to be light too. And up the back. And there's going to be a runoff over here as the, as the horse powers on. There's going to be more popping water here. Over we go. So, that's how we do the 
Now, of course, we've got reflections down here, so I'm going to run that down. And I'm going to put a little in there later to break that water up. This horse is just in front of the other one, so I'll run this like this. Over there, and bang, bingo, off we go. That was the name of one of my dogs, was Bingo. And a good dog he was. Had a lot of fun with him. He lived in America. He was an American dog, and he was the same as the Australian dogs. And even Furby and Noonoop, my two dogs here, they would, they would support me in that claim, I'm sure. Now this big light finding their way there. And so on. There we go. So that's how. Let's have a look at what we did there. I'll take you off your little perch. Here you come. Now, if we, in a workshop, for example, and you want to do a painting like this, I'll have prepared, as I said earlier, a number of paintings that we can do together. I'll have a finished product, I'll have one that's finished, and I'll say, do you want to paint that one? Because if that's the mood you're after, if, you, if that's also got the technique that you're trying to understand, then let's do that painting. Who wants to do that painting? So if we've got enough people using a democratic system, they say, yes, we want to do that, because it's a mood type thing, it's an action type painting, and not many people paint that. So if that's what you want to learn to paint, we can do it. We can see what we're going to try and accomplish, do it with the photographs and so on so as much as we can paint outdoors and take from what we see outdoors because we've got some wonderful places we're going to be we can also work indoors with comfort and with determination and with a program of, of, of um, a program objective so there you are so there you are folks how about that what do you think of that now let's see who's with us we got a, and I'll say hello to, to, to who's with us. And I better wrap up. Looking good, Dad Graham. Uh, Bill is off. Hello, uh, Laurie. Hello from Grand Mound, Washington. There you go. D Deborah Atherton. Hello, Robert. Joy Hackendorf from Johnston, Colorado. Joy, sign up for the workshop. Diane Land. Hello, Robert. So nice to see you. Uh, Ch Charlene Boyer. Charlene, good to see you over in, in Florida. Linda Whitten, hello everyone. Hello Linda. Charlene, what a day you had. Hello for, from Amber O'Connor, Richie Richie. Ronnie Richie, hi you Robert, love your work. Ronnie from Down Under. Where are you Ronnie? Whereabouts in Aussie are you from? Let me know. Teresa Howell, one of those nights breaking up and freezing up. We'll do a skippy version of this when I finish, alright? Um, this is all info I'd love to hear but it's cutting out and freezing for me too. That's Raheen Desperada. Uh, Raheen, come back later on in about two hours and I'll have this loaded up as a, a skippy version so there'll be no interruptions and so forth. You'll have a, a clean shot at it. Uh, freezing Colorado. Yeah, that's, uh, well, that's, this is freezing. Colorado's freezing. Um, hello, Robert, to see you in... Sh Sherry McClod. Yes, Sherry. Um, Sherry signed up for the workshop in Colorado, so we look forward to seeing Sher uh, Sherry there. And we'll have a great time. We'll do one of these horse paintings, if you want to. And we'll just see where we go with the whole thing, okay? So um, it's good to see you all. And, um, and I'm going to say bye 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 to you now. And I'll let you go and have your wonderful weekend. And um, if, you, if you, again, look at those closing dates for the workshop. And um, sign up because I'm on my way. I've bought my ticket. So I've got, a, I've got just a long swim across the Pacific. I'll possibly have a, have a, um, a day's break in Hawaii. Um, and then I'll venture on, I'll pack some, I'll make up some more sandwiches and then I'll strap them to my back in a plastic bag and I'll swim from Hawaii straight over to San Francisco. No, I'm going to land in Guardia actually. So I'll be swimming around the, the uh, South America, up the side and then coming in via New York. There you go. So whatever. But I'll be there and I look forward to meeting all of you again. Have a great weekend and um, happy painting.